great, great. Uh, you're terrific. <laughs> okay, so, so tonight I asked you to um, send me two pictures. Uh, some of you actually sent three. Uh, send me two pictures and write comparing the two. And um, I'd like to start uh, as soon as possible on this. But I want to I want to remind you that after today, we have three classes. Uh, the first class is I will present on um, Klimt, and actually it would be Klimt and Sheila, Klimt and Sheila, and there is an exhibit on Klimt at the Neue Gallery. The second class I will present on. Kovitz, Kata Kovitz, at, and there's an exhibit of her work at the Museum of Modern Art. If you have time constraints and you can only see one of these exhibits, the one that I would recommend would be the one of Kovitz. Yeah. I haven't seen that, but I would, my my inclination would be that that would be an exhibit with more um, reverberation. But I'm not, I can't say because I'm not totally sure. Then the third class you would present on two images of any of the art, any of the art that we've seen or any other art from those artists that we haven't seen. So it would be Klimt, Sheila, and Kovitz, and Kovitz. So tonight, um, we, I'm just going to go through the sequence that I got based on your presentations, based on your sending me information. So the first... May, may, may I ask a question? The last class is the 17th of April? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so tonight... The first person who sent me material was Evelyn. So I'm going to see if I could share the screen and get to Evelyn's piece. Okay, Evelyn, I'm correct, right? Yes. Yes, so- Those are the ones. You should, you should speak. Okay, let me- um... Let me just straighten this out on the side. Okay. All right. So um, just before I start about the two portraits, I just want to share what I learned is that the term, the new objectivity, actually came from the title of an art show, which opened in June of 1925. And uh, there were 124 paintings in the show. And they were selected because they represented a new kind of figure painting, as we have learned. And the term itself, new objectivity, became fashionable because of that sort of catchy and a makeshift almost term, uh, because it encompassed such a wide variety of styles. And new objectivity is essentially um, a stylistic movement. So that's why it's sort of hard to pin down a definitive definition. Terrific, um, terrific. Thank you so much. I should have I should have known that. It, yeah, I mean, because terrific. they call it a movement, yes. uh, but it uh, was called a movement by the curator of the show. But really, uh, there was no manifesto, no organized artist group, just basically a new way of looking at the object. Okay, and, so and, and it took on a life of its own that term. No, that's great, Evelyn. We want to keep this to around four minutes. Okay, I'll try. So portraits played a significant role uh, in the movement, and I'm going to start with the one on the left by Otto Dix. Uh, this is a portrait of Sylvia von Harden, a mixture of oil and tempera on um, a wooden panel painted in 1926. Uh, she was a writer, a poet, an intellectual uh, with very strong features and the bobbed haircut 
um, example of the Berlin emancipated woman of the 20s. And rather than reach into von Harden uh, uh, as an individual, Dix appropriates her and uses her as a vehicle for his style um, and as an expression of the Weimar zeitgeist. Um, she is seated alone, legs crossed at a table in the corner of what's a cafe and close up to the viewer in kind of a three quarter position um, against a, a featureless background, pink and red. So there's nothing to distract our um, uh, from her challenging pose. Um, her face is sharply triangular, um, almost mask-like with a long, thin nose, dark red lipstick, uh, eyes half closed as if she's in thought. She doesn't engage the viewer. Um, and a bold check dress covers her flat androgynous body. Um, the figure's exaggerated position, um, all angles, awkward angles, um, sort of represents uh, the de-individualized de distortions that Dix creates. I think he may even reference 16th century mannerism in those elongated nervous figures and maybe even African masks in her mask-like face. And all of this acute sort of... Um, uh, uh, demonstrates, communicates a kind of a jerky anxiety, discord, which are all hallmarks of Dix's style. Um, and the sharp angularity of the figure is balanced in the composition by the round table, um, which is tilted towards us and the curved sinuous wood of, of the chair and the base of the table. And um, also by that monocle um, is sort of a reference to her mm -hmm. intellectuality, but it may be kind of sarcastic because all it is really is, is a black circle kind of plopped over her right eye. Um, and he doesn't place her in just any cafe. Uh, she is in the Romanische Cafe, mm -hmm. which is a 1920s hangout for Berlin's avant-garde. And the cigarette case on the table bears her name, but the matchbook um, displays the German imperial eagle. So this, uh, this is a dynamic culture in hectic transition, uh, the present challenging the past. Um, and by the way, something else I learned that, um, I don't know if we remember the 1972 movie Cabaret, um, the, uh, there's a likeness, uh, a take on this portrait that's flashed for a second in the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie. I'm so not, I'm not surprised. Yeah, so somebody was having a good time with that, um, kind of an in-joke maybe. In contrast to Dix's portrait is this portrait on the right of jo uh, by George Gross, of the writer Max Hermann Nysip, painted it in 1925, oil on canvas. And the subject is dressed in a black three-piece suit. He's seated with, seated with his head in kind of three-quarter profile, legs fully crossed, in an armchair covered with a floral uh, upholstery. Unlike Dix's relationship with von Harden, which was based on a chance encounter, Gross and Hermann Nese enjoyed a long, close friendship. Uh, and in contrast to Dix's stylized take on von Harden, Gross's portrait considers Hermann Nese not as a type, but as a fully realized individual. He's seated quietly, alone, lips pursed in deep thought. And like von Harden, his gaze does not engage the viewer. The background is plain not distracting, and the flowers on the upholstery provide kind of a gentle, harmonious setting. The distortions that are evident in Hermann Nice's person, his hunched back, overly large head, and the short torso are not stylized effects. He was burdened by a form of dwarfism, which fortunately, did not prevent him from um, actively engaging in Berlin's 
cultural and nightlife uh, together with Gross. Um, he Gross paints um, his person, uh, uh, the person of uh, his subject, the veins in great detail, the veins of his large hands, his well-modeled head, and um, and his serious inward expression, very attentively, very humanely, desensitively and affectionately communicates the humanity of his friend. Um, and something else I learned is that Gross, of course, had been using drawing as a medium, uh, particularly for a social critique, but this portrait was his first work in oil. Mm. And he and uh, Hermann Neisse met numerous times for studies and sketches before he started on the oil. And he wrote, he wrote, he painted something uh, similar, um, not identical, about a year later. So I believe that the term new objectivity provided a convenient, generalized kind of umbrella term um, that developed a life of its own. And the artists who created during this period their daring and diverse art uh, provided the explosive talent. Uh, I think you did very well. And, it, and it, you you presented something that's different from what you wrote to me about in other words, you you asked me a, in your note to me about, <clears throat> would you mind if I uh, present in a bullet-like procession of information? And, you know, I just wanted to encourage you. So I said, yes, but I was really thinking it would be better instead of having bullets to have actual paragraphs and Mm. an essay format and I think that seems to be what I've heard well they turned into sentences <laughs> okay good 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 it just I want to just comment on one thing you said which was um the use of temper and oil now temper and oil don't mix together you can't mix them but I think what George Gross uh what uh, Otto Dix did was he painted an underpainting in tempera. Oh, okay. Okay, the, then the underpainting dried and over that came oil and all of his uh, crazy directions, crazy um, insights or psychological dimensions. But the, the uh, tempera and oil don't mix. Temper is more astringent. Oil is a different kind of medium than temper. So I just wanted to say something about that. But no, I, liked, I liked all the details in what you wrote. The details indicated to me very hard looking, very slow and hard looking. And I thought you did extremely well with that. Extremely. Um, I just in the interest of getting as many in as possible, we'll do a few. And then if there are comments, we'll get to the comments. Um, the next one I have is Anna. So I hope I have this right. Anna, is this yours? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay. Shall I begin? Yeah. Okay. Two paintings. At first, they are perceived as equal, the same, two meals outside, two groups of people together. The first one on the left was painted by Felice Casarati around 1910, and the second by Lottie Lassestein around 1930. The Casarati revolves around a grinning matriarch surrounded by four younger women, are those her daughters, a naked child, and an older man, perhaps he is her husband. This is a painting of a family together. Note to the cat lying next to the table, eyes wide open. The sculpture of the naked man in front of the not too happy woman, the one sitting by the matriarch's side. The expression of the three other women, one looking over the table with an air of concern, the other two ladies looking directly at the painter, the one besides the morose young woman, also seeming gloomy, 
the leaf of a flower pot directly in front of her mouth, while the other woman smiles in delight, perhaps delight with the painter or her love of the little one who sits next to her, her backside to us. We know she's a girl because of the flower in her hair. The child's doll lays prone upon the table, a table full of books and flowers and apples, cups and saucers, and those books, so many books, one of which is being read by the old man, who perhaps enjoys the company of the story more than that of his family. But what is that box in front of the old lady? And why is the beautiful woman next to her so sad? especially given the setting, the Italian countryside, complete with farmland and a stunning view. The morose woman's sadness somehow connects this image to Lottie Lassestein's Evening Over Potsdam, which is a large scale painting and truly a masterpiece. The focal point, a young woman with an equally morose expression, or perhaps she's even sadder, her face exhibiting profound grief, it, could I just interrupt just for a second? Yeah, sure. This is terrific. Yeah, really, really uh, uh, zeroing in on those two women and their melancholy state within a tumult of activity. It's mm -hmm. just terrific. Keep going. Okay, where am I? Her face exhibiting profound grief. She sits alongside two gentlemen, one next to her, the other across the table, both of them also presenting a sense of loss and confusion. We know this not so much by the look on their faces, but more so by their body language, in which it seems that they are almost prone, as the world may be too much to bear. To the left of one man stands another woman with her back to us. She appears lost in thought as she looks over the balcony towards the city of Potsdam. To the right is the final member of this party, this woman able to bear her grief as she attends to the task of pouring liquid into a cup. The two men are drinking beer while everyone else has been, everyone has been eating bread and sliced pear. It's not a cat this time, but a dog on the floor underneath the table, looking as morose and sad as the humans. This group of people appears to be a gathering of friends connected perhaps by a common understanding, a worldview, and a love of a place in Germany called Potsdam. Germany at the end of the Weimar Republic, a country in transition, a people in transition. The quality of the painting technique is different in each piece. The Lazistein painting on a wood panel, while the Caserati surface appears more like canvas. A naturalist approach is evident in each, although the Caserati faces have a caricature-like quality. We might guess that the Caserati was completed more quickly and the Lassistine required many hours of painting time. Mm. Both paintings ask us to consider the world beyond these tables and the greater forces of life, which are clearly looming over both parties. Both paintings take us back to an earlier time where people gathered to eat and chat, but perhaps also just to be together. Yeah, terrific. Uh, I love the juxtaposition of these two. I think it's fa fabulous. And um, a lot recently has come out about Lottie Lassestein, or Lassestein, however you want to pronounce it. And um, she's really worth, well, both of them are really worth looking up. La Lassestein is more new to me, and um, I think she's terrific. I think her sense of form and weight and um, art is really terrific. I do too, yeah. She, she was her own person, and I almost think that she's the, she could easily be the subject of a film or of a book or of a play or there's something about her and about her world that she came from and what she ended up doing that is um, a, a very big, a big dramatic statement. Um, but um, this is her major painting, this one here on the right. Um, let, let's just keep going. Um, I'm a little concerned about the time 
So these these are um, Kathy's, who who is not here tonight. So she she sent me three, which are these two and this one. Okay, so these two and this one. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read hers. Um, Did you skip one? Yeah, I, I skipped one because that one is very long, and I'm not sure it, it's going to take away from from others. I, oh, I, okay. I did skip one. That one I have to read too, but this is shorter. Okay. Um, that that's the reason. Yeah. Um, so this is Kathy <laughs> Furamaska. Uh, the thread that weaves these three paintings together is the theme of children at play. Here we see three children with toys on a checkered floor by Conazio di San Pietro, Girl on a Red Carpet by Felice Pazzarate, and Voyage by Simon Dinnerstein. In all three paintings, the observer's vantage point is from above, which of course is the eye level of an adult to children. The similarities continue here to include toys as props or grouped into still lifes. In Di San Pietro's painting, the toys are carefully placed around the figures, filling in the negative space, thereby unifying the composition of the seated figures. While in Casarate's painting, the toys, books, and other props appear strewn around the figure. The toys in Dynastine's painting show the objects through carefully, though carefully placed on the canvas, moving rapidly along the swirling path surrounding the central figure. Each painting makes use of the principle of pattern. In Di San Pietro's painting, we see the geometric pattern of the <clears throat> tile floor, while Casarati's painting shows the floral pattern of the carpet. Both show recession or movement into the picture plane by the diminution of the repetitive shapes. In the and can we see those images? Yes. I can, I yes. can only see yours. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Both show recession or movement into the picture plane by the diminution of the repetitive shapes. In the painting voyage, however, rapid movement is depicted by the spiral vortex of lime in the cadmium red paint. Lastly, all three paintings show the figures of children in quiet rather than active play. Di San Pietro and Casarati's figures are, while serene, engaged in literal play with their toys, while in Simon's painting, the child is involved in the play of the imagination, which of course is limitless. Um, anyway, so that's, that is um, Kathy. Carla read last week, she read two poems she is traveling. She couldn't be here today. There was a question I had about the two images. So these are the two images. And I remembered the first one. I guessed at the second one. And I guessed correctly at the second one. So she read two poems that she wrote about these two. So the next person I have is... Um, um, I believe is Rita. Rita, is, the, uh, is these yours? Right above, the ones above. Uh, these? Oh, I'm sorry, these, these, yeah. yes. yes. You should go. Okay. I chose Felice Casarati's Girl on Red Carpet from 1912 and why it's Christina Olsen, 1947. These two paintings spoke to me. 
These two paintings are both realistically detailed with familiar figurative forms and a contained emotional temperature. Definitely not hot expressionism. However, these paintings are not exactly new objectivity either. They are timeless rather than current in attitude, pensive rather than confrontational, sincere rather than sardonic. Mm -hmm. Felice Casarati's wistful daydreamer is on the cusp of adolescence, embraced by a world of grace and promise, not quite ready to travel toward the brilliantly hued future that is stretching out beyond her in a dramatically infinite flower-strewn path. She dawdles languidly among the artifacts of her youthful innocence. Her legs splayed in awkward charm, childhood companion in petting distance, doll already rejected, picture books abandoned, apples and grapes yet to be tasted, Amid unopened jewel boxes filled with life's riches, she is suspended in that magic prepubescent moment on that magic carpet. Super. Her, tra her traveling shoes are already on, but she, but still she lingers. Andrew Wyatt's Christina, with the stillness and marble translucence of an ancient Greek statue, rests at her weathered doorstep. She is rooted here. The spare riches of her world are not in crimson or in a profusion of flowers, but in a muted, worn palette, except for a bath of light that illuminates her soul. She is pared down to her essence. Is this the sun's radiance that floods down from above? Or is it her inner glow that radiates out to the heavens? Her door is ajar to the universe. Her skin is warmed. The trees have leaves. The sky is clear. The shadows deep. Life has already presented her with its inscrutability. She neither looks inward nor outward. There is a profound and comfortable solitude here. She turns towards the light and simply abides. Two paintings, two women, objective, subjective. They are the bookends of our lives. Oh, that's great. Well, <laughs> it's terrific. Uh, can you go back to a sentence you read about the one, the painting on the left? I think it started, she dawdles. Yes. Uh, Casarati's wistful daydreamer is on the cusp of adolescence, embraced by a world of grace and promise. Uh, uh, not quite ready to travel towards the brilliantly hued future that is stretching out beyond her in a dramatically infinite flower-strewn path, she dawdles languidly among the artifacts of her youthful innocence. Terrific, terrific. Um, it, the here down quality in contrast to the sensuality of the adjectives and your prose is wonderful because since it's also pared down the adjectives sort of burst you know like pop and um this is a terrific piece of writing it really <laughs> really terrific um um Let's do one more and then, or maybe two more. And then if there are comments other than mine, we'll, we'll, we'll do a few of those. So the next one I have is uh, Len. Now, let me make sure I have this right. This wasn't so easy to do. Len, is this yours or is yeah, this? Yeah, I'm, I'm 10, someone else is nine. Okay, okay. So Len, you go. Oh. We're skipping nine? Uh, no, let's do nine first. Let's do nine and then yeah. 10. So nine, I think, is Ron, right? Yes. The Wyeth, the Wyeth and the... And the Lucian Freud. And the Freud, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, you go. Okay, uh, this is going to be a little different for me because... Click on nine, Simon. I feel as though I've been steeped in... 
in art critis art, art critical <laughs> verbiage, having listened to the the recording of last week on Monday night. And Simon, we were inspired on, by the Simon, click on nine so we I'm sorry, Ron. Simon, click on nine so we can see. Ron. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um there we go. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Usually I write, this is going to be a little bit more ad hoc, and I will finish with uh, an, in, an inspiration which caused me to write some drivel in the way of poetry. But um, as I've commented before, I often see the Wyeth in the Albuquerque Museum. It's I, I love it. I go back to it. It is an object in and of itself, in addition to the thingness, the objectivity of the subject. Both of these portraits I found extremely powerful and had a powerful reaction to them, particularly with the information about the life of Lucian Freud, his relationships, and then afterwards looking at a lot of his painting, which is just monumental and I find ex extremely impressive. The, um, the aspects of these two that I chose to focus on is the the impression of the sitter, the impression of the subject, the lighting of the subject, the contrast in the smoothness, the velvety quality of the egg tempera painting by, by the Wyeth in contrast to the heavily uh, impastoed uh, portrait that almost becomes a, a sculpture in itself. My association to the portrait, to the Freud, the Freud was that this struck me as like a wax figure that could be converted through the lost wax process to mm. a bronze uh, visage of this sitter. And the uh, reading about the Wyeth, uh, this Carl, he considered to be his best portrait. It, um, his father died in a, 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 an accident. I think it was a, an auto train collision uh, a couple of years before, and his work was rather dark. He had enjoyed the visit of New Mexico artist Peter Hurd, who came to study drawing and painting with Andrew's father and taught Andrew the art of, of egg tempera painting. And it said that, that Wyeth appreciated the slow, small brush strokes required with egg tempera because he felt the watercolor and oil paint allowed him to work too quickly without really looking. And uh, he took this up. That's a, very, that's a very interesting point. But the interesting thing about Carl is that after his father's death, Carl became a kind of godfather, a figure that he treated as, as his substitute father and neighbor ron the, just to make sure i understand this the person who died was nc wyeth yes okay okay but, not carl not carl's father no no this was this was wyeth's father okay okay go ahead but um the i i made a photograph just of a portion of the painting but the uh what my reaction uh, led to this writing. I want you to know that I've, I've not been drinking real alcohol. This is non-alcoholic beer <laughs> as, as, as a preface. Hi, Carl, you ominous bastard. I'm drawn to you like a flame. Immigrant farmer with a German name you gaze with the curiosity and pity of an executioner. No, it's not a basement with a blood-stained floor, and those aren't really hooks for piano wire nooses. No, you don't scare me anymore. Those two windows give you light, soft, softly rendered by a tempera brush in the hand of a loving sun. That light is everywhere, every surface done. Hey, Lucian, did Grandpa Siggy know your id? Did you fashion this image out of oil and wax to be lost and immortalized? Does the fear in your eyes reflect the glow 
of an infernal climax in molten bronze, and that light you summon around you from every angle like a torchlight parade cast shadows as improbable as the slaking of your manic lust. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. Very good. What, what's, what strikes me about the, the Freud painting is it has shadows, but the shadows are impossible given the lighting of the rest of the figure. It, it's just an interesting kind of a surreal aspect of it, but that's that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, just one just slight comment. It, the you you have changed the um, uh, rectangle for the painting on the left. The actual rectangle is that he's very low in the space, and the space sweeps upward. So he's positioned uh, in a mm -hmm. endingly low manner on the rectangle, and the composition is. Um, Really, really stunning, um, and I think that adds to um, the power of the painting. You have that hook. This was apparently an attic where they would hang and dry meat. Yeah, but that that hook is so ominous. Yeah, and the hook itself has a wonderful shadowing effect. Yeah, it it, it it's it's almost the subject of the painting rather than the. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's go on to, um, Len, which is this one. This is correct, right, Len? That's right. Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, we have here two paintings by Lucian Freud. On the left is Girl with a Kitten, 1947, oil on canvas, 12 by 15 inches. And on the right, Esther and Albie. 1995, oil on canvas, 11 by 15 inches. <clears throat> when an image is stripped of emotion and sentimentality, we are left with its essence. This does not necessarily mean we're left with something interesting. Indeed, the vast majority of images we encounter are mundane. What makes an image compelling if it's stripped of emotion? In the hands of Lucian Freud, it is subject, composition, and technique. Girl with a Kitten and Esther and Albie are unsentimental yet compelling. They convey a certain savagery. They are works you do not wish to encounter late at night in a dark alley. Consider Girl with a Kitten. We see Kathleen Kitty Garman one year before she wed Lucian Freud. If we remove the cat from the composition, we are left with an elegant young woman, immaculately dressed. Her features portrayed with great care from her limpid eyes to her pale skin, elegant lips, delicate brows and lashes. But add the kitten, and the composition becomes something else entirely. Super. Kathleen grasps the small life by its neck. The kitten is calm, suggesting no malice in her grip. We imagine Kathleen's other hand cradling the kitten's body, so it is not harmed under its own weight. But her protruding knuckles convey tension. Might she harm the creature inadvertently, not realizing the power of her elegant hands, a la Lenny from Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. Mm. Taken as a whole, the composition exudes a fragile danger, and we are left with a sense of foreboding. Then consider Esther and Alby composed 48 years later. Has a mother and child ever been so devoid of sentimentality? This is not the warm bond between mother and infant. Esther is reduced to her pendulous engorged breast, veins pushing to the surface 
in a rainbow skewed blue, indigo, and violet. She cradles Albie in workmanlike fashion as a Russian peasant pausing between strokes of a scythe to nourish her offspring. Albie is not drawn lovingly. Freud has reduced him to a series of aggressive impasto brushstrokes. He is to be seen, but not adored. A timeless act of giving is ultimately functional. Tenderness is an afterthought. In both instances, Freud shows how an artist can be emotionally distant from the subject, yet still elevate that subject from mundane to electric through the surgical use of composition and technique. Yeah, terrific. <clears throat> um, I've heard um, I've heard Len read a number of times now, and um, I am very struck by his writing. But something occurred to me in this this particular time is it, Len's voice, his actual voice, and the voice in his reading and probably a writer wants to have a certain voice connected with their writing and um one i i would imagine a writer struggles to get that voice whatever the voice is and um it's quite a voice you have here <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a voice, really. I, I always read it read it aloud to myself to make sure it flows. And it, it really is, you know, for me, it's like the elimination of gratuitous words. Like I'm always trying to just get rid of the gratuitous. And when it when I get down to what I feel sounds okay, it makes me more confident in presenting it. Yes, but but what you're conveying is goes past gratuitous words. It's a voice of, um, I'd have to really think about that voice, but it's it's a voice that's quite definite. It, it, it has a certain uh, mood to it. Um, uh, it's a certain kind of narrator. Um, but I, I'm not quick enough now to find the right way to explain this. So I'm just going to stop. <laughs> uh, OK, does anyone have a thought, comment, question, or something to add to what we've heard already? You mean about all of the paintings, or just this? Anyone, anyone. Any, any non secular that you can think of? <laughs> But when you say Lynn's voice, I think you might be saying uh, the style becomes recognizable. You associate it with Lynn, like you you could read read it, open a book, open a page, read it, and you'll know that it was Lynn who wrote it. You hear his voice in the writing. Yes, I I yes, that's some that's the beginning of my feeling. But there's more to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just a voice that I recognize. It's a voice that has dot, 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 dot in it, which I I don't want to be off in describing. So I'm just going to leave it as dot, 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 dot. <laughs> OK, so, so, so I, it, I yeah. just wanted to say one thing, Simon, which is I'm really appreciating seeing the images that people have chosen because as I've said to you previously in emails, I yeah. was feeling a little overwhelmed by all of the images yes. and yes. I, I was picking up a lot of kind of negative energy in the images and the ones that people have chosen, I don't feel that way about. So I think it's been really helpful to me in terms of connecting to see That's people's great. choices. That's great. One of the students, I don't know if she's here now, um see if i can is uh, eileen here now eileen 
she wrote a very interesting note to me and she said um uh dear simon uh, these are some of my favorite paintings and drawings from the last 50 years hmm. i cannot figure out which ones to to um choose it is really really bothering me i can't make up my mind i can't choose i don't even think i'm going to come wow. <laughs> So it, was, it was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous. These are some of my favorite paintings. I can't choose. So I don't know. Maybe that's a little bit like the woman holding the cat there. Um, but I'm going to get back to you, Len. Well, the woman holding Len, the don't, cat don't, is kind of ominous. <laughs> Len, don't run away. I'm going to get back to you, but it might not be tonight. But <laughs> your voice, your voice has um, um, something, and I can't, I can't get my, I can't put my finger on it. But it, it's, it's just wonderful. But anyway, let's let let's keep going. Now, oh, now uh, this is um, this one is Frank's. Now this is Frank Horton, and Frank is from the previous class or two classes ago. He's the person who I had a wonderful interaction with where I asked him how he came to this class. And he said that he went to an auction and bought a print of mine at the auction and then realized that I taught this class. You remember him, he just couldn't come tonight. He wasn't feeling well. So I'm gonna read his. He chose these two. Um, he starts with a poem of called Blanche McCarthy by Wallace Stevens. Look in the terrible mirror of the sky and not in this dead glass, which can reflect only the surfaces, the bending arm, the leaning shoulder, and the searching eye. Look in the terrible mirror of the sky. Oh, bend against the invisible and lean to symbols of descending night and search the glare of revelations going by. Look in the terrible mirror of the sky. See how the absent moon waits in the glade of your dark self and how the wings of stars upward from unimagined coverts fly. So then he continues here I'm going to talk about the uncanny and its presence in two paintings by George Tucker, the Government Bureau and The Voice One. I want to discuss the strange, haunting, mysterious mood that pervades these works and draw attention to a common aesthetic motif that Tucker uses to help create the, this mood. The aesthetic motif I'm interested in is repetition. In an interview Tucker once gave late in life, he said that his paintings were born of his subconscious. With that admission of Tucker's, it's perhaps forgivable to bring in Freud and briefly discuss his definition of the uncanny. In a 1919 essay on the uncanny Freud, on the uncanny, Freud writes that the uncanny is not merely the weird or the strange, it's the strangely familiar. The familiar and unfamiliar brought together, commingling with each other. Freud points out that in one of the ways the uncanny can be produced is by taking something mundane and familiar and through an act of mechanical repetition, 
transforming it into something unfamiliar and strange. In George Tooker's Government Bureau, we are confronted with an array of repetitions that define the space and the figures. The repetitions create a maze-like labyrinthine environment populated with seemingly identical anonymous figures sharing identical or near identical postures, clothes, hairstyles, shoes. Aided by the linear perspective, the long line of repeating figures on the right side suggest an infinite repetition. In the government bureau, the repetition of identical forms and figures breaks the perceptual bounds of logic, but without violating the laws of naturalism. For viewers, the severance between logic and naturalism registered in registers in visceral terms. Paradoxically, the split generates a concurrent sense of engagement and estrangement. Engagement and estrangement. My repetition. In The Voice One, Tooker presents a doubling of figures. As an uncanny trope, the double has a long history in works of art and literature. Commonly, the appearance of the double is closely associated with a breakdown in the unity of the self, a splitting of an identity in two, a sort of ghosting of one's self to oneself. In a study on the uncanny, the author Nicholas Royal writes, it is also impossible to conceive of the uncanny without a sense of the ghostliness, as a sense of strangeness given to dissolving all assurances about the identity of a self. In the voice one, the relationship between the two figures is steeped in mystery. The compositional arrangement of the wall induces a feeling of anxiety. The figure on the left is boxed in a claustrophobic space, shut in by the wall and the border of the frame. We have only the eyes of the figure on the right to help us figure out what might be the content of the communication. Is it a revelation? If Freud were viewing this work, he might put forward his theory that connects uncanny doubling with repression. Freud believed that the uncanny use of repetition often concerned the repressed part of the psyche, a part of the self once hidden, but now no longer refusing to be. Does the shaded figure of the left represent the dark self? Perhaps, but what if focusing on the separation is a mistake? What if the two figures aren't wall separated by the wall? What if the wall joins them, unites them? Every separation is a link a philosopher once said. Um, yeah, that's great. That's really something. That's <laughs> something. Um, I, it's too bad Frank isn't here uh, because um, it's just too bad. Um, so the next one that I have is Carol, which I hope this is right. Yeah. Good, good. It is, and... Uh... Aren't I lucky to follow that one? <laughs> I I didn't I I'm sorry I swear Did that to me on I didn't mean it I didn't mean it like that I just <laughs> you're next that's all. <laughs> uh, okay, um, this is new objectivity and new life for women. New objectivity reflecting the changes of the interwar period also clearly reflected the new life of women. 
But the artists who are traditionally recognized as part of new Wave objectivity were virtually all men. And while they acknowledged that part of the change, that part of the changed world, they were looking. I'm I'm sorry, I stuck a comma in that screwed me up. And while they acknowledged that that part of the change world they were looking at included a radical change in the role of women, they don't appear to have been too comfortable with it. On the other hand, a major change was happening among women artists. These two paintings are examples of the work of women artists of the period reflecting their view of the new women, woman. The painting on the left by Lottie Lazarstein, Trout a Rose with Tie, was executed around 1931. It is 42 by 48 using mixed media, and I really couldn't find more definite information about that. Gertrude Trouder Rose was a longtime friend of Lazarstein's and a model for her from about 1925 until Lazarstein fled to Germany to avoid the Nazis. It was in fact Rose who saved many of Lazarstein's paintings by taking them out of Germany after Lazarstein's work, Lazarstein's work was banned. The second work is earlier. It is Girl with a Red Shawl by Gwen John, painted between 1917 and 1923. It's quite small, as were most of John's portraits. It's 17 and 3 quarters inches by 13 and a half. It's oil on canvas, but it is a canvas, very unusual. It was first treated with a mixture of animal glue and chalk, creating a rough, very textured surface which John then painted over with a very thin layer of oil paint. This creates the almost crackled look, which can also look as if the sun is shining very brightly on the painting. While the work of these two artists is very different, they both actually paint with an intimate realism, painting traditionally, but with contemporary themes. Trouder with red tie, much more than the girl with the red shawl, reflects the extraordinary change in women's lives during this period. Trouder is androgynous, yet very sexy and kind of in your face. But unlike the women done by the male painters of new objectivity, there's no distortion in her features, no caricaturing. She could easily be in a late 19th century portrait if you put a gown on her and added more hair. The girl with the red shawl is a portrait of one of John's many anonymous models. Unlike Trouda, though, she is very serene, very self-possessed. It would be easy to say that she's not very different from a portrait of a peasant woman years before, but there is something quite modern about her. Her face has a much more knowing, modern look. And unlike Lazarstein, her technique is certainly new. While both lack the harsh criticism of most of the male artists, they definitely show a new objectivity. That's it. Wow, that's great. That's great. Um, I like the juxtaposition to poor your main theme, which is this is a depiction of the new woman. Yeah. It's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, let's go, let's go to the next one. Oh, but one thing more about this is that your the choices that you make are really part of your essay. Uh, an interesting juxtaposition really sets the writing up, sets up the whole mood and thrust of the writing. Um, that's probably obvious, but um, it's, it's pointing out. Uh -huh. for, it, it, just for instance, in the piece that um, Michael Pierce wrote about my work, his choice of those pictures, of those images, was his choice. 
not mine, not the editor, not anyone else. He chose that, and that was the theme that he was going after. And it it, it really was exceptional, an uh, exceptional piece of writing that was governed by those choices. Um, so the next one is... Uh, is Kristen? Yep. This one? Yep. Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> the painting on the left is by Casarati, and it was from 1908. It's 51 inches by 44 inches. And the painting on the right is by Celia Paul. So so if I could just interrupt you. The choice here is super. The The juxtaposition of these two does just exactly what I said and propels your theme, I, I'm sure, forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, what happens when a group of women gather together? Mm -hmm. Perhaps they are friends, sisters, or motherly figures to one another. Close companionship, connection, comfort with one another. These two paintings depicting women together, both composed largely of muted shades of gray, could make striking companion pieces in terms of their color palettes. Just but, terrific. The, terrific. But, the, but the contrast in emotional energy that pours forth from both is dramatic and profound. The women in the Casarati painting seem to be full of affection and joy, perhaps even celebrating something. Their arrangement, gestures, and the bright glint of mischief in their eyes draws the viewer in toward them, wondering exactly what they may be engaged in as they huddle and move from the left side of the painting. Even the seated woman with her downcast eyes does not seem unhappy, but comforted it as she sits wrapped in the warmth of the patterns of shawls and blankets and also wrapped by the affections of her companions. These women are bright with energy, radiating the other, utter joy of being in one another's company, made visible by the lightness and care in the quality of paint. Every wrinkle is carefully attended to for most of the women. The brightness here is found directly in their faces, in their eyes. The wry knowing looks which draw the viewer in, wanting to know of the secret that brings them to know something we do not. They are keeping this to themselves. In contrast, the four women in the Celia Paul painting are almost knitted together, radiating stillness. But the viewer is immediately pulled downward toward their feet, which are below the frame, nearly into a pit of despair. Though they are touching one another, there does not seem to be any interaction, no animation whatsoever. They are almost ghost-like. They are somber, melancholic, haunting, and sorrowful. Mm. However, contrast exists even within this work. Shadows linger behind the woman on the right who looks the most like Celia Paul herself. But there is also beauty and a lightness, almost iridescence in the subdued grays and tans of the paint. Yet the overall mood is heavy, even with the light that illuminates the women on the left from behind. There, everyone's faces and hands are painted with a thick roughness, wax-like a fog. Are they preparing for death, already in death? There is not an ounce of joy here. Women as companions, there is no single image of what it might be. Mm. And I, interestingly, I didn't look until after I did this at the titles of these paintings, and I'm glad that I didn't because I think I thought differently about them. Um, and the titles, the one on the left, the Kazarati is called The Old Gossips, because <clears throat> I really wondered what they were doing together and then found that title later. And the painting on the right, um, the Celia Paul, is called My Sisters in Mourning. Mm -hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> one thing I was thinking of when you were reading, uh, which the whole the whole piece you wrote is terrific, and the juxtaposition terrific. One thing I was thinking of is why these two paintings don't appear sentimental. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it might be I don't know the the actual answer, but it might be the answer is in the direction of a certain weirdness that both of them have. Mm -hmm. Kind of idiosyncratic vision that is not a gloss but goes deep inside and what, uh, what do you mean simon by not appearing sentimental what i mean i know you were just talking about it but what i mean is what does sentimental mean to you in this context uh, sentimental is a kind of um quasi phony response where you are eliciting sentiment um, without really working at it. You're, okay. elic you're eliciting a gesture of pathos without the deep understanding of what pathos is. That's to me. Okay. And to, me, both, to me, both of these are um, deep and... Um, they don't have easy answers. They're they're. Um, mm -hmm. I I wish I could say more, but um, that's immediately what hits me. Um, would someone else want to say something? Well, sentimentality always hits you right in your face. Uh, you know, when paintings are more subtle. You don't have a problem with sentimentality. Sentimentality is uh, mm, pejorative. It's what? What? Pejorative. I can hear you. I couldn't hear you. Pejorative. Pejorative. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of um, cheaper, a cheaper artistic form. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to say that. That I just loved Kristen's open line, opening line. Which could you say again, Kristen? Uh, I have to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like or when a group of women gather together? Mm -hmm. What happens, actually? I think I changed that in the moment. Good. What, what happens? happens when a group of women gather together? Yeah, I loved it. It was yeah. just right for this. Yeah, What's... I realized right at the last minute that it was more about what, not what it looks like, but what is, what is happening. So let's let's continue. I think that this is Marilyn. Marilyn, am I correct? Marilyn. She must. Well, if if she's not here, yeah, her her screen is blank. Maybe she had to oh, go okay. for a minute. Okay, we'll come back to her then. Uh, this one, I think, is Bruni. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, oh, you're here. Great. Great. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been here, but I'm here now. <laughs> good, good, good. And I'm this kind of very catching up. Uh, Bruni, this is a very interesting choice, these two. <laughs> I'm just starting to look at these images. There are so many artists and so many paintings. It's... Uh, it's a lot, so I'm trying to simplify. So the title of my essay is In Search of New Objectivity. And so I want to give a little introduction before I go into the paintings. Okay, um, but you, you have to keep it to about four minutes. Okay. I want to get to know Otto Dix like I know Monet and Matisse, Van Gogh, and other European artists. Throughout the years, I've skimmed over his work, neglected his war images, and resisted delving deeper into his world. What a pity. Why has the power of his work eluded, eluded me? In art school, one is smitten with French and Italian art. Why is it that German art does not occupy the same stature? 
At least this has been my experience. Why is neo-objectivity still resisted? Is it too deep, complex, philosophical, theoretical in its pursuit of truth? Too unsavory to digest? I believe all art is subjective. Can the art of new objectivity readjust my thinking? So let's begin with the image on the left. It's a self-portrait. Before, before you continue, okay. you, your introduction is brilliant. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Let's begin with the image on the left. A self-portrait of the artist is a young man. He is 22 years old. The year is 1913. In a few months, Dix will enlist into World War I. The size of this painting is quite small. I couldn't get the size of it, by the way. And it's most likely executed in oil. And I wonder, who is this young man, so intense and provocative? I am struck by his sharp, penetrating gaze, a gaze so direct it breaks through the canvas, reaches out and touches the viewer, me, you, the world. He is somewhere between a boy and a man, de determined, confident in his artistic ability. Well yet, he, well yet he looks a little sad and vulnerable. I love the handling of the paint, the dark and light contrasts, the textures, the white light over his eyebrow. I love the strong shadows, the moody palette. I like this somber, youthful, intense, expressionistic painting. So this is how I feel about this portrait, that Dix is a creative bomb ready to explode. Am I being objective? Moving on to the painting on the right, executed 14 years later in 1927, Dix has miraculous, miraculously survived the ravages of war and at this time is 36 years old, married, and a father. Here in this image, color enters in and changes the mood in his life. I find it odd how Dix squeezes himself into the side of the picture plane, his large hand reaching out. I find his smile odd as well. After all, Dix is a very serious painter. He never smiles. But here, the miracle of life expressed through his son has transformed him into a cooing, silly, playful boy, all smiles and teeth. By painting himself small and, rele and relegated to the sideline, the feminine is affirmed. Tenderness, softness, sweetness has melted away. Male intensity and hardness what is sweeter than a beautiful child offering a flower? What is more powerful than a mother taking center stage in the family unit? It is the feminine energy that saves him from insanity, healing the wounded soldier from his nightmares. Is this an objective work of art? I question it. I sense that somewhere between 1913 and 1927, through war and marriage, a transformation or a fusion of contrary selves has occurred between boy and man, man and artist, soft and hard, subjectivity and reality. A new creature has emerged from the ashes of war, from ground zero, one who is well blended, balanced, lucid, and perhaps more objective. With this new consciousness, he is intent on capturing a dysfunctional 1920s Germany. So no other art movement captures the neurosis of a society like new objectivity. However, I question, is Dix completely objective or does he project something of himself into his work? Does he at times paint caricatures? cartoonish people whose worst traits are exaggerated. He seems to have a knack for capturing only the ugly and the diseased. Nevertheless, new objectivity is a powerful movement that is a well-kept secret. No one speaks or writes much about these artists and their works and how they sounded a loud alarm, how they prophesized of impending insanity and death. Am I being objective? 
<laughs> well done. Very well done. Uh, well. Uh, just one sentence comment on Mr. Dix, and <laughs> I'm going to go on. He was a first class maniac. Okay. <laughs> First class, first class. I yeah. have to delve yeah. more into him, yeah. In other situations, he would have ended up in a mental asylum. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I know really, art saved, art is redeeming. A hundred percent nut job. <laughs> was, that, was that before or after the war? Before, after, and during. <laughs> before, after, and during, of all, of all. Um, this one, uh, who's who wrote? You're that? skipping one again. This one. Yeah. Okay. Who did who did this? Um, that's me, Mary. Oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the picture on the left. This is the artist's daughter by George Tooker, nineteen fifty-five. It is twenty-three and three-quarter inches by eleven and three-quarter inches created with egg tempera and gesso wood panel. I believe it's at the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art. The viewer looks into a girl who looks out from behind a bush. Dappled sunlight drops onto her rounded voluminous golden head and dances throughout the composition. Tooker has so carefully rendered this girl with a hyperrealistic softness. There is a knowing and anxious cast in her huge almond-shaped pale blue eyes. While the work is modern and of an ecstatic and altered reality, the girl stands in a classical contraposo position, her bare and intricately detailed feet softly on the earth like a mythical goddess, an intricate and her pale blue dress falls over the subtle organic rhythm of her body, reminiscent of a Bellini saint. While standing in front of a white brick wall with filtered light, the girl appears to be one with the plant. There is an interplay between her fingers, gently caressing the branches and leaves. She is of the natural world. Who is this mysterious child? She is not the artist's daughter. Tooker never had children. He was a gay man who was outwardly gay in the 1950s in America. Supposedly, a friend of his in the New York art scene at that time teased him about the girl's resemblance to himself. And so, the title. Mm. Um, the artist's daughter is beautiful, radiant, timeless work by a true visionary artist, George Tucker. And on the right is Counterpoint, which is a work by Simon Dynasty, Conta Crayon, Colored Pencil and Pastel on Paper, 52 or 3 eighths inches by 40 and an eighth inch. And what year was it done in? I don't remember. I don't, anyway, 70s, 80s? No, I, I think. 80s or 90s. I can't, I can't remember. 80s or 90s. Okay. Um, the man sits cornered by a very large plant that shoots from a large clay pot on the floor next to him. From the left side, streams in brilliant and dazzling light, spilling over the architecture of the window frame, riveting luminous shades of rose, lavender, peach, sage green, the color of green tea whatever that is. The light illuminates the man's head. The shifting contours, flesh tones, and translucent colors of his face rest into his very thick full beard. Under the dark arcs of his brow, of his brows, his deep set eyes hold a penetrating gaze, revealing a depth of sadness, suggesting trauma and recovery. His solidity is connected to the architecture of the building. Is he a saint? His garment reminds one of a monk's robe. The weight of his hands are clasped together in a prayer pose that is strangely connected to the finger forms of the plant. Mm. The plant is so alive, delicate, light. Its blooms reach into the light. 
the plant is nearly reaching out of the work, and in the upper right corner, the fronds almost root themselves into the sand-colored architecture. The man is planted next to the plant. The lightness and ecstasy of the cactus is medicine for the heavy man. Not one color in the painting is only one color. Uh, that's it. I didn't really finish because no, it was great. so great. hard picking out. Um, <laughs> two, two little comments about this. Um, actually, I forgot the second comment. But the first comment is that um, um, many people, oh, I, I remember the second one now. Many people, when they see this reproduction, think that this is me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I find that very interesting. Uh, he's very striking looking. Um, yeah. I know the model, Simon. I know who, who he is. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, so. yeah but he's very striking looking. Very. And, uh, but pe many people have said, is that me? And I think it has to do with the beard. <laughs> the beard and the fact that the artist is kind of slyly off to the side and mm, somewhat yeah. hidden, somewhat hidden. The second comment is that there is a painting by Lucian Freud, which shows, it would have been a good third one to do, which shows him in front of a plant. But uh -huh. it, no, him behind a plant but way behind. And the plant is very muscular and very um, passionately painted. Um, I, I'll try to bring uh, get a reproduction of that next time. Okay. Um, let's go on to this one. Mm -hmm. who, who did this? Yeah, that's mine. Oh, OK. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, well, this is uh, Christina's World by Andrew Wyeth, and it's approximately uh, two feet, eight inches uh, by 11 feet, let's see, three feet, 11 inches. It was painted in 1948, and the medium is temp uh, egg temper on wood. Um, the other is The Subway by George Tooker. It's approximately one and a half feet by three feet. It was painted in 1950. And the medium is also egg temper on wood. Uh, both are similar size, same medium, same time period. The characteristics of new objectivity in these paintings is their naturalism. These paintings bring you to a specific place and time. We see human beings depicted in a contemporary setting, but there is something more in, the, in these paintings than what we see. The artist's extraordinary skill set is subservient to the art, to the mood, to the emotion. The feeling I experience from these paintings is anxiety, a feeling of alienation, not being where one needs to be. In Christina's world, the outer world looks safe. Rolling hills, soft grass, warm weather. But is it? Is it safe for Christina? Christina doesn't look capable of walking. How will she get to the house? Is it too far away? Why was she left alone? How did she get to this place? So many questions. The exterior and, and interior life of the painting creates a force that is destabilizing. In the subway, we have an enclosed large space, but a feeling of claustrophobia. We see small private spaces, stairways going up and down, tunnels going back, but there are no signs that say where you are or where you are going. The feeling is that these people do not know where they are going. <laughs> Fear is, per is pervasive, maybe even hopelessness. <laughs> these paintings reflect the human condition with questions it provokes, such as, where are we and where are we going? Are mm -hmm. we alone? Is the, is the world safe? Mm -hmm. will, will we be safe? Mm -hmm. big, big questions with no sure answers. These paintings to me are powerful statements about the human condition. 
Simon's quote from the poet George Oppen is appropriate here. Truth is also the pursuit of it. These paintings to me are in pursuit of the truth of our humanness. That is a beautiful piece of writing. Really, really beautiful. Uh, and um, I like the questions you're asking and the questions indicate the realness and the palpability of the art. So it presses you and it asks you to ask a question. And I think that makes the art very successful. It's pushing you to ask a question of yourself or the artist or of someone else or some deity or some child or a passerby or a stranger. What's going on here? Yes. Yes, maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't know where they're going. <laughs> that would be the funniest. They don't know where they're going. <laughs> they're stuck. They're stuck. They're stuck in the subway. They don't know where they're going. Right. They don't. Yeah. They don't have a stop. They don't have a destination. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, I I really like what you wrote. It's very both serious and um, I... there's a kind of playfulness about it that that is um, quite compelling. Um, Compliments. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So this one, I think this one is Jim. Jim. <laughs> Ta -da! Jim. Ta -da! Here I am. Okay. Here I am. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We flipped the tour, haven't we? Um, so. Um, this, this painting was done in uh, 1950, a tempera. Um, it's 18 and a half by 36 and a half inches. Um, took her commenting on this painting, commenting on the subway, said a denial of the senses and a negation of life itself. Um, well, you should see the subway now, George Tooker. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. This is 1950. He was saying that. So it's eerie, disturbing, and surreal. Maybe it's a small heightening of what the subway is really like. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you. We all take the subway, I guess. But when I'm on the subway, I become hawk-eyed, scanning the environment constantly. I'll change seats and change cars if I have to. Um, hell, hell of a way to live, hell of a way to uh, to travel. Um, look at the anxious eyes of the woman in front and note that no one is relating to anyone else. Um, it's a it's a disturbing, claustrophobic, wonderful, amazing painting that communicates some very real things about life right now and about New York City right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think together we've done I think we've done a good job, Anne Marie, of talking about this painting. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So um, the other painting is Balthus. And um, this is influenced by Piero della Francesca and also Alice in Wonderland. So the, um, the girl in front on the left is possibly Alice herself. The guy who's accosting her is Tweedledum or Tweedledee. Uh, Tweedledum or Tweedledee is also um, towards the right of the painting. Um, the um, figure, the figure in back with the chef's toque on him, is not a person at all, but it's a uh, it's a restaurant sign. And the guy in white, walking towards the presumably restaurant, he has another sign, which I guess we'll um, talk about the 
fair of the uh, of the day. Um, Malthus is really interesting. Um, tell you a couple of things about this. Maybe maybe you all know it, but um, the Tweedledum figure who's accosting the girl on the left. When Balthus originally painted this, the Tweedledum had his hand right on the girl's crotch. Um, the owner of the painting asked Balthus to change it because he wanted to <laughs> hang it without people getting upset. And Balthus changed it. It's pretty, pretty cooperative. It was a young Balthus at the time. I don't know if he would have done it if he had been older. Um, this is uh, this painting hangs in the Museum of Modern Art. It's not up right now. It was, it was always up for a long time. Um, Balthus is endlessly fascinating. Um, maybe you all know this, but Balthus's mother, the great poet Roque, was uh, Balthus's mother's lover. Uh -huh. um, so um, yeah, Balthus had an, had an interesting life. Um, I have a I have a very peripheral at a great distance connection to Balthus. Um, and uh, so I'll brag about it. Actually, there's nothing to brag about. Um, Balthus's biographer, Nicholas Fox Weber, is married to my former wife's cousin. <laughs> and um, one of the things that happened is that Weber was actually spent a lot of time, or spent some time staying with Balthus, living with Balthus. And um, he brought his young daughters in. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to in interject something. There was a great scandal in uh, twenty when was it twenty seventeen. Um, during the height of the Me Too period, when people wanted a painting hanging in the Metropolitan Museum um, to be taken down. It's called uh, Dreaming. And uh, if you if you um, if you Google it, you'll you'll see that it's a pretty interesting painting. Uh, the Met refused to take it down. Um, so when Nicholas brought his daughters to hang around with Balthus. People were saying, you know, he, he has this thing about young girls. Better be careful. Well, everything, everything was cool, of course. Um, Balthus did have a thing about young girls. Um, he was a great artist. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend him or not defend him. I think that, I think, uh, Art makes its own rules sometimes. Um, that's uh, that's pretty much it. So, I mean, two scenes of two very different scenes of alienation, um, and uh, two great paintings. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Yes. Excellent. Very nicely done. Thank you. Um, yeah, really nicely done. I think the last one is Victoria's. Am I correct? Yeah, I'm going. To, I'm Those going are mine. To... I didn't. I didn't think I was going to be able to have time to do this. Um, I'm going to need to go now. Sorry, but okay. thank you all, and okay. thank you. Simon. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, I do you want to speak on these, Victoria, or not? Um. Well, I don't. I don't have my notes in front of me because I didn't think I was. Okay. All right, then that's fine. That's fine. I think oh, it's it's so fairly hard. light. It's fairly, it's fairly light, and um, oh. so um, I'm going to see you next week, and I'm going to introduce next week uh, uh, the work of Klimt, which is at the Neue Gallery. So the Neue Gallery is at um, 86th Street, 
and Fifth Avenue. And um, the way this worked out, that exhibit is juxtaposed with the exhibit of Colvitz, which is at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so um, these have been exceptional pieces and um, thank you so much. And uh, um, I'll see you next time. Okay. Yep. Thank Good you. night. Good okay. night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Good thank you. Thanks, Simon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Simon, a comment about that Baltus. Yeah. Does the man in white remind you of any other paintings? The man in white? In okay. white. Carrying the, 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 the plank. This last painting here? Yes. Uh -huh. Does the man on the right? No, the man in the white suit. Oh, oh, the man in the white suit. Because for, for me, it's right out of Kayabot. Oh, the really? Really? This is the references to the painters. And if you look at that large Kayabot of the whole square, you'll see those two guys carrying ladders at the, in small, very tiny figures at the very back. I don't know whether Baltus had any any kind of uh, resonance with uh, Kayabot at all, but it just struck me as being very reminiscent. That I have to think about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I'm I'm going to see if I could get the recording to work. So I'm going to leave you now. Okay. Uh, and um, thank you for participating, and see you next week. So stop recording.